put whatever that thing is at his feet right now. That thing that popped into your head. That thing that, that you wonder, do I love Jesus more than this?
all about Jesus. He is preeminent. Go ahead and be seated if you will. Let me explain what I just said. And why is it about Jesus? First of all, who is Jesus? He is Jesus, the Son of the living God. He today sits on the right hand of the Father. He is interceding on our behalf, the Bible says. He's carrying your needs and all of your petitions to the Father. He cares greatly about you. But that didn't begin in no space. There was a point in time before the foundations of this world that God in his foreknowledge knew and understood that we, mankind, would rebel against our Creator. And in so doing, God had to make for a, provi a, a provision for that sinful act. And I can imagine the conversation of heaven going something like this. The Father saying to the Son, I have a work for you to do. Ironically, this is Labor Day weekend, and our nation sets this day aside to recognize the fact of the labor force that exists in this nation, and other nations do likewise. But that idea began before the United States government initiated such a holiday. In the regions of heaven, Father God says to his son, I have a work for you to do. To provide redemption for my creation that has sinned and turned their back on me. And Jesus willingly came to the planet that date was sometime, oh, maybe 2,000 years back. And Jesus willingly gave himself so that you and I can be cleansed of our sin and from all of our unrighteousness. I don't have all of the time to get into that today, but I do want to say, we want to commemorate or recognize and bring to remembrance this complete perfect plan of the Father to provide for us redemption. The early church practiced the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. Paul himself told us to do likewise as oft as we remember what God has done for us. And to recognize this completed work of Jesus, we on a regular basis participate in communion with the Lord's Supper. We do so, we have a packet that we have provided for you today. This packet contains a wafer and it contains some grape juice, the fruit of the vine. The, the wafer represents the body of Jesus that was given, crucified, on behalf of our sin. Jesus willingly gave himself for our redemption. This packet also includes, as I said earlier, the fruit of the vine, grape juice, which represents the blood of Jesus. 
Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus shed his blood for the remission of our sins. The service has been all about Jesus. Why Jesus? Why not the next guy? Because the next guy couldn't do it. Jesus is the only one that could provide redemption, him being the Son of God. The sinless Lamb of God gave himself so that we could experience forgiveness of sins. And we gather in this place today just so grateful to Jesus for what he had done for us. You probably remember the moment in time when you committed your life to Jesus. That was a game changer for you. It started you on a different pathway. And we get to celebrate Jesus this morning. So I want you to take this wafer that is in this packet. And as you hold it in your hand, recognize that it symbolizes the body of Jesus. Going beyond the fact that he, Jesus, was crucified for us, you got to go to the place where he was willing to give his body before it was actually crucified. Jesus' will aligned with the will of the Father to provide for your redemption and my redemption and salvation. So with gratefulness for Jesus, to Jesus, for yielding himself, and there was no argument in heaven, Jesus willingly paid the price. I want you to take this wafer as it represents the body of Jesus given for our salvation, and let's eat together. When you think of the blood trail that was left by Jesus, for the removal of our sins, you can't help but go back to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he agonized over the, the load that he would carry of all of our sins. The Bible says he sweat drops of blood. He was arrested in that garden. He was flogged. A crown of thorns were was placed upon him go into all of the detail but he ended up on the cross further mutilated and the last act of eliminating blood from Jesus body was done by a soldier who took a spear pierced Jesus side and out of his side flowed both blood and water Jesus gave his blood for the remission of our sins if you ever question that need to read your Bible and be reassured of what Jesus did. And today, we're ever so grateful for the fact that he gave himself and he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. Take this cup. Let's drink. And remember that Jesus' blood was enough to cleanse you from all of your sin and unrighteousness. Let's drink together. that remain in our worship time, I want you to lift your hearts and give yourself totally 
and worship through our loving Savior, Jesus.
pretty awesome. You know, the one, sometimes the most profound thing that we can say in relation to what Jesus has done for us is thank you. Psalms 150 tells us how to thank him. And the Reader's Digest version of that, it's not a long psalm, but the Reader's Digest version of that goes like this. Let everything that hath breath Praise ye the Lord. Come on, give Jesus more honor today. Awesome. All right, go ahead and be seated. Thank you, musicians. You're an amazing team here today. Awesome. Well, this is now turning the corner into the fall months, and we as a church family have so many things to, to offer you here today in your growth and your pursuit of Jesus. I hope, really, I hope you, you have an ambition to grow in your relationship with Jesus and with one another. That's huge. It starts by yielding our life to the Lord, but it goes way beyond that. Now we're on a pathway. And we want to help you get to a better place in your relationship with Jesus and the assignment that he has for you and in your relationship with each other in the family of God. So here's how we're gonna do this. I, I wanna make you aware of the fact that uh, Starting next Sunday, well, actually it starts today, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. Starting next Sunday, we're going to get you on a pathway if you have not yet been baptized in water. I'm going to do a class at 9.30 a.m. next Sunday morning for everyone who wants to be baptized in water and then for each of those that want to be baptized in water, we're going to gather at the 101 bridge, under the 101 bridge on the Hump Tulips River. There's a large parking lot, and there's an easy trail that takes you down to the water's edge. We scope that out. It's going to be ideal. It's going to be a good place to get baptized. We're going to do a class at 9.30 a.m. next Sunday, 5 p.m. We're going to ask that you gather with us and anybody else that wants to make the trip and witness this amazing event of lives being transformed by the power of Jesus and starting a new journey. You see, water baptism is an outward demonstration of what Jesus has done within our lives. We've been buried in Christ, and we arise out of the water to demonstrate a new walk with him. And that's going to be on public display next Sunday afternoon. That's next Sunday. Then we come to the 15th, and that is huge for us because that officially is Back to Church Sunday. Thank you for being here, but you're going to make a commitment to stay the trail. And we talked about that last Sunday, and we're going to engage in a lot of things. Following the morning service, we're going to have a time of fellowship in the fireside room. We're going to have soup, rolls. The tables will be spread out there. You'll be able to fellowship. You'll be able to meet each other and just spend time with the family of God. But on that day as well, we're going to launch several ministries for the next several months. One of the most popular that we do is Titus Woman. And there is a display in the hallway uh, of the Titus Woman curriculum. And I'm encouraging each and every lady to get yourself involved in this study group. And sign your name, be a part of um, Titus Woman. Based on the sign-up, 
We will have different classes available. More details will be forthcoming. Then we'll also be launching our Kingdom Man series. David uh, Freeberg is going to oversee this study. Guys, I want you to know this. Becoming a Kingdom Man is an uphill climb. It's not a natural thing for you to get saved and all of a sudden come into the full understanding of everything that God has for you. How many have ever done a mountain ascent? And about the first hundred yards, you wondered if you're gonna make it to the top of this mountain. Well, that's kind of what the kingdom journey is like for us men. God lays on us all kinds of responsibilities. We make daily decisions and choices, and these need to be in keeping with our kingdom assignment. You're gonna learn what the assignment is. You're gonna learn of what it takes to be a kingdom man. And Dave will be there. He'll be helping you sign up today and getting you acclimated to the journey, all right? Then we have another class there. Anne's going to be doing a class on hearing the voice of God. Now, I, I want you to know, not every voice that you hear is the voice of God. And Anne's going to help you navigate that journey because that's the enemy's way, the enemy has a way of sidetracking us and keeping us off balance. God has a way of leaning into our lives, providing direction not only by his word, but through spiritual authority and the witness of the Holy Spirit in our life. And these three buoys need to line up. If they don't line up, you're not on the right path. And Anne's going to help you navigate the journey of hearing the voice of God. So anyone that would like to be a part of that training, you can sign up even today. We're going to be pushing that and for the next two Sundays so that you can be uh, very well acclimated to these uh, pathways. Ben, come tell us what's happening with the youth tonight and uh, give us more details. So I'll just be really quick. We have a barbecue tonight at my house. Um, and if you don't know where that is, 20, uh, 21, 20, hold on, 2122 Herbig Avenue, I think. I haven't set my address in a long time, I guess. That was crazy. Um, do we have a, okay, we do not have our graphic. But yes, it'll be at my house tonight. If you have any questions, parents, youth, come talk to us. It's, we're going back to school. So we want to have another hurrah. We just had an amazing time at conference and camp. And so, please, if you're available, come to the barbecue tonight. It's going to be an amazing time. Don't go run away. you got dwelling place, too. Help us out when that is. Okay, and then we have our young adult group on Friday nights. We'll be off this next week. But then we will be continuing to go um, every Friday except for the first Friday of the month. And it's been such a sweet and special time. And then we do have an event that's coming up in a few weeks that as we get, I mean, I'll just tell you, we have a worship night that's coming up for the community on October 19th. Please mark your calendars. It's going to be an incredible night. Um, as of right now, it's looking like we're going to be able to get Aberdeen High School. We're going to go into the auditorium, into the enemy's territory, and place down the flag and claim it for the kingdom. So it's going to be a really special time. Mark your calendars for October 19th. You talk awfully fast, Ben. That worship event in October is going to be embraced by a number of churches, too, at the Aberdeen High School Auditorium. And uh, you need to mark your calendar. We want to pack that place. We want to see the presence of God, and we want to see the manifest glory of God come down upon the church in Grays Harbor. Amen? Awesome. We want to encourage you to give to the work and ministry of Cornerstone Church. That being said, there are ways, I've said this every Sunday for the last hundred years, that you can give online, you can give today. But I do want to say something about giving. Unless you have learned 
the joy of giving, you're missing out on a lot. The faithfulness of God. You know, I, I just want to say this. Uh, Ben's heard me say this. Uh, sometimes when I go golfing with Ben or anybody that's a believer, and my ball hits a tree and bounces into the fairway, do you know what my response to that is? Come on, tell us, Ben. That's a tithing bounce. How many know we walk under the favor and the canopy of God's blessings? So when your ball is destined to go out of bounds and it hits a tree and comes back in bounds, I want you to know that's a tithing bounce. I want you to know it doesn't only apply to golf, it applies to your life. You come under the canopy in the favor of God. So learn the discipline of tithing, giving to the work and ministry of, of Cornerstone Church. And as we uh, get on a pathway to finish out this year, we want to do so and believe God to have provision for what he wants us to accomplish. Thank you for what you do in that regard. I'm going to share with you this morning a message in light of... Oh, you do. Does anybody know what yesterday was? What was yesterday? I know. You do know? What was, it? What was yesterday? Our number five, six wedding anniversary. <laughs> 56 years. What a testimony to this house and, and what a pleasure it is to serve and to, to be a part of this fellowship when we have leaders that have a solid marriage, whose family is serving God. What a testimony to their devotion, not only to one another, but to the Lord. And on behalf of the congregation, uh, Larry and Sharon, <laughs> congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank you, John. <laughs> thank you very much. We appreciate it. Wow, this is a card, and it's got some money in it. It says, celebrate the years and all the blessings he has given you through each other. Happy anniversary. It says in the Message Bible, God delivers generous love. I want to thank you for your love. By the way, this check, I haven't looked at it yet. But uh, um, we, we have, I don't know if you know this, on our finances, I'm, I'm, I've got this figured out. I've been doing this since we were married. We have an envelope system. If you don't have an envelope system, you should get an envelope system. What does that mean? Well, it means that when you come into some finances, be it your salary or a gift like this, uh, by the way, this gift is a money gift, so we'll tithe on a money gift. We've done that for 100 a, a years. And so that's just the way of life for us, okay? But when you have an envelope system, it, it goes this way. You have, um, of course, you have uh, over and above your tithes, your bills, your livelihood or your expenses there's such a thing as um like a, a larry fund a sharon fund um a gas fund you know uh our gas fund has we've been doing a lot of traveling this summer and the gas fund has been diminishing sharon had just done a shopping spree her fund is zero <laughs> I, I, I think we're going to have to invest this, whatever it is, into Sharon's shopping fund. <laughs> Maybe we'll squeeze out some gas fund money for this. But I just want you to know that um, uh, we love you. We thank you for what you do to show your support and your love to us. Thank you so much. And I'm going to let you pack that off. It's very heavy. And, Great. 
All right, Ben, let's see that pulpit here, all right? Thank you so much again. In light of some of our culture wars that you and I are facing in this day and age, I thought it would be appropriate to take this Labor Day weekend and uh, speak to what should be the posture of us as Christians in our world today. And there are different schools of thought, and I'd like to weigh in on some of that today if I could. Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 25. I'm going to read for you out of the modern English version. One of Ben's favorite. I'm going to read to you. It may come up that way in the NSAB, but here's how it comes in the MEV. He, Jesus, told him another parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Got the picture? It goes on and says, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Can I make a proclamation or a statement this morning? Bad things happen when good people sleep. Can I repeat it? Bad things happen when good people sleep. When people drift from God into their own self-interest, they also drift into a spiritual slumber. And that's why great revivals are called awakenings. They wake up people to the realities of God. I want to give you three words this morning and their meanings. The two first words set up where I want to go. They simply are tyranny, liberty, and freedom. The last word I want to give you is freedom. And then I want to launch off from there and share with you the heart of this message this morning. The first word is tyranny. What is tyranny? I'm going to give you a, a concise overview of what that word actually means. Tyranny is top-down, cruel, and oppressive rule by one person who has total and absolute power. Tyranny functions as the tool of one's quest for power without the regard for the general welfare of the people. There's absolutely no accountability when it comes to tyranny. Tyrants see people as tools, okay? Let's move to the second. Liberty, on the other hand, is freedom within moral constraints. Liberty is freedom that regards the freedom of others. Liberty is birthed in self-restraint and self-control. Patrick Henry, how many remember him? Nobody? Were we that weak in our American history? Patrick Henry did not say, give me freedom or give me death. But he did say, give me liberty or give me death. He and others understood 
that without moral standards and restraints, freedom would be lost. And we call that civilization. And when a society loses its law and moral standards and restraints, it ceases to be civilized. Now I come to the third word, freedom. This may surprise some of you this morning, but freedom can be good or evil, depending on the responsibility of those who are free. You're free to choose either good or evil. God has given each and every person a free will. The Bible speaks about freedom. And when it does, it's speaking about that which we have been set free from. Talked a little bit about that this morning during our communion time. You see, spiritual freedom in Christ means to be set free from the tyranny of evil and all of its kinds. That is, so that we can serve Jesus within the boundaries of his purpose. Now, we could call that being liberated from sin and into true liberty. I hope you get this. But on the other hand this morning, if we use freedom from something without moral restraint or selfishly, then we become slaves to self and to our own passion. And that ultimately destroys us and the freedom of others. The tyranny of self-centeredness leads to self-destruction. And at this point, I want to give you the big picture. I want to contrast for you if I may, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Two extremes. And let me start by saying Satan is properly called the destroyer in Revelation chapter 9 and verse number 11. I want you to know something about him this morning. Satan is not a builder. He does only one thing, and that is he destroys. His motive is to tear down what others have built up, to tear down lives, to tear down nations, and every peace-producing system on the planet. He thrives in chaos. Think about it. You need to discern the essence of his work because he often disguises his work in causes. Not every cause is a good cause. And he'll do it by motivating self-centered and divisive strife. Now, on the other hand, I want to tell you, God is a builder. He built creation from the micro to the macro. From a grain of sand to the galaxy. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, we, we learn that he constructs, he builds. Jesus builds his church, the Bible says. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. His gifts are for edification, are for the building up of the saints so that they can do the work of the ministry. And he builds within moral constraints. 
It's critical for us that we understand who does what here. Because you see, a lot of people give misguided information that God is responsible for all the damage on the planet. That's not so. Satan tears down and God builds up. We have to have a fundamental understanding of that truth in our life. God's ultimate purpose is to build a holy people who will live in a holy city. And in this city of God, let me describe it for you. There is righteousness. That simply means everything is right. There's peace. There's joy in the Holy Spirit in the city of God. And Satan's ultimate purpose is to keep us from getting there and to turn our cities into colonies of hell. That's his goal. And it often seems as though we only figure that out when our cities are on fire. Let me explain. Even prior to our new birth in Jesus, We've been given a measure of free will, freedom to choose. Adam and Eve made a choice. The Bible says they ate from a tree that, we, that they were forbidden to participate in. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's always been amazing to me how the knowledge of good and evil did not prevent Adam and Eve from a wrong choice. It's always been interesting to my thinking. Nevertheless, God gives us that choice. He has all power but he's not a tyrant. He wants us to love and trust him willingly so that he can bless us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. By the way, that's what the Bible says and teaches us. God reigns by love because he is love and he is the father of love. Even God respects our freedom to choose. Let me contrast that. Satan does not love. He is incapable of loving. He is merely seductive and selfish from day one. I wish we could see him as he truly is. He is the epitome of ugly, and fierce, acting like a roaring and ravaging lion. But I want you to understand our enemy dresses well. And all the while, he's plotting our destruction. You need to know that. That's his game. So my purpose is to undress evil this morning and present it to us and others as the naked enemy that he is. And hopefully we'll be better for it. And as we walk out our Christian journey, we'll have better understanding. How many know Putin is merely a tool Hitler was merely a tool. And we've got to see the one who pulls the strings, the manipulator, Satan himself. It's clear to us this morning that Hitler is gone 
and Putin will be gone one day. But the real enemy, Satan, still remains. We've got, we better be on our guard. And the Bible helps us to stay in the know. We must look beyond and behind the natural manifestations. So in Christ, we find spiritual discernment. Discernment says, I see a devil for who you are. That's what discernment is. It gets a, gives us a quick read on the situation and directs us to the source. And we need our blinded eyes opened in this day and age. You see, secularism, socialism, communism, and any other antichrist system, it only grows in the darkness while good men and women sleep. And we've slept too long. And we need another spiritual awakening. We need a revival such as we've never seen before to awaken us to the things of God and the purposes of God. Let me, let me give you two camps here. They're fairly obvious from what I've already said. Number one is the way of God. This is a way of liberty, the way of Jesus. This system is rooted in moral constraints. Liberty is freedom that regards the freedoms of others. Look at your program this morning. I didn't know they were gonna do this, but it says, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. It's found in Galatians chapter five, verse number one. The way of God. And my, my challenge to you this morning is to clearly understand you're our either one or two pathways. There isn't a third. You're on the pathway or the way of God, or secondly, the way of Satan. And this system counters everything that God, the builder, has erected. Our enemy is determined to destroy everything that has to do with God. And that includes you, by the way. That includes your family. It includes, it includes every biblical value that you stand for. The way of Satan. It's not complicated, church. We can make it complicated when we start weaving in our causes and our, our to-dos and our spins and you know, all of those things. It's not a political thing where you buy somebody out. Or It's just two ways. The way of God or the way of Satan. And we have daily choices to make. And I'm here to tell you that your daily choices are going to sow into one of the two pathways. As Jesus said in Matthew, while men slept, the enemy came. Wow. The people of God, I believe, need to be awakened. And I just want to awaken you this morning. I trust you had a good sleep last night, and you got all your faculties here this morning. And I'm not talking about physical sleep talking about your spiritual awakening to hear and see the ways and the purposes of God. You might have neglected your spiritual journey for way too long. You've been asleep. You've been in a slumber. 
It's time to wake up. This is a good time to do that. Come the fall months. Regroup, retool your life. Not look back, but begin to look forward to that which God has before you. Because if the people of God ever get awakened, look out. Can I put it this way? It's never too late to save our children. It's never too late to choose right leaders. You got to look to the core, the value system. As it has once been said, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. So make it the choice for God, for his righteousness to prevail. Some of you will remember this song, but others probably don't even know it existed. I asked Nolan today, have you ever heard this song? He says, no. There's a gospel song that says this. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. To have that resolve is critically important. Whereas this is Labor Day weekend and we associate Labor Day weekend with the last actual weekend for us to kind of vacation, holiday, we do what we do, can I ratchet it up a little bit and remind you that labor means work? And Labor Day is about working, reminding ourselves that it's time to roll up our sleeves and realize that God is a builder and he's got a work for us to do and we'll work till Jesus comes. I, I want to differentiate from the fact that we don't work for our salvation, by the way. Galatians tells us it's not by works lest any man should boast. So your salvation isn't by works but when you get saved you partner with God the builder and you work with him Isn't that true so we need to find our place and build with God so many places we need help thank you Ben for taking our youth to camp and with your able assistance but it's work and as the youth group grows we need more help as our Sunday school grows we need more help as the church grows how many know there is just a boatload of opportunities to serve and as we start the fall you should be looking for where you can serve and advance the purposes of God by the way you may not know this it's in your program our theme as a church for 2024 you forgot it I know but let me help you out it's working with Jesus. That's our theme. If I could sing it, I'd sing it. We'll work till Jesus comes. But we're on two pathways, one of two pathways here today. Pathway, the one I want to emphasize, is the pathway of the builder, the pathway of God. And we want to build with him. We don't want to tear down one another. We're not here to tear down the work of God. 
We're to come alongside of God and build with Jesus and see his work progress in Grace Harbor. By the way, I just want to say it also, we're not at war with any other churches in Grace Harbor. We want to work arm in arm, and I want to say come November, uh, October, when we partner with other churches, Ben's brainchild of having a time of coming together to worship in the Aberdeen High School Auditorium. It's going to be a wonderful way of building up the body of Christ identifying one another in the family of God in this region and coming alongside and seeing the kingdom advance. You see, Jesus said it, while man slept, the enemy came. It's time to wake up to the purposes of God, to the ways of the enemy. Make kingdom choices. You're going to have so many opportunities this fall to grow in your faith. Because we, not a one of us, have arrived. There's room for improvement in every one of our lives. So we're on a pathway. with God and we will work till Jesus comes stand to your feet with me please by the way I didn't I didn't make this song up so I can't take credit for it but it does say we'll work till Jesus comes it doesn't say I'll work till Jesus comes it says we'll work till Jesus comes that means that there's a, a recognition of a team effort here. So let's do it. Join hands with the team. Come on, find somebody, join hands. I want to pray for you this morning that we will adopt a kingdom mindset and that we will partner with God, build with him, build with Jesus, and we will be the people of God. Amen? Man, come pray for us. Just lead us into the presence of Jesus as we join our hands and our hearts together. Precious Jesus, we thank you for the work that you did. This started from the moment that you bankrupt heaven as heaven's darling and came to earth. You then lived a perfect life day in and day out. You were spotless and blameless. Lord, and we thank you that you've grafted this into your family. And that we want to show you our faith, not by our words, but by our works, Lord. As James says, he says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So, Father, I ask for you to provide avenues for us to come in and not just serve in the ways we want to, but the way we're needed to, Lord. And Father, I pray that you just wake us up for this next season, a season in which you're gonna pour your spirit out in such a special and unique way, but that requires workers. That requires people to come into alignment with your will and serve the kingdom on earth. Lord, may your will be done in our lives and in these situations. And Father, I pray that you prepare each and every heart for what you have ahead. And yes, that's work in the church, but that's also work in just seeking you and spending time in the scriptures, Lord, spending time in prayer. So Father, I ask that you mark our hearts with a fresh revelation of how you would like us to serve you and prepare every heart for what's coming. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In your holy name we pray, amen. Thank you, Ben. One last assignment before I let you go. I want you to get proactive, okay? 
want you to turn to at least three people before you leave this place. And I want you to say to somebody, let's, hear me out, let's do the way of God together. Let's do the way of God together. That means we're going to turn our back on the way of the devil, right? We're going to do the work and the will of God. Turn. Come on. Let's do this. We're going to break out from here. God bless you. Let's do. Come on, church. Let's do the way of God together.